Joining me on this edition of Against the Current, uh, coming to you live from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic Building in downtown Chicago, is Chief Economist of the Heritage Foundation, New Trier grad, former Wall Street Journal editorial Bears board member. Bears middle linebacker. Bears middle <laughs> linebacker uh, from the Buckus era. He is Steve Moore. Steve, thanks so much Hi, for Dan. joining us again. Appreciate it. Uh, the book, Fueling Freedom. Got to get the book promo in right out, right at the top. Got to get the book. And I got to get, get the, the book. book. <laughs> and I got to get the book promo in. Fueling Freedom, uh, the title indicates it's about the energy sector. Right. Uh, give us the... So the uh, subtitle is The Mad War Against Energy. And mm -hmm. it's ba basically how the left is trying to shut down our, our energy in this country and how um, that's one theme. And the other theme is, boy, if we get this right and we really promote our um, American energy, coal, oil, gas, which we have more of than any other country in the world, we can be the energy dominant country in the world and within five or six years and we can be the new Saudi Arabia that has huge implications for our economy and huge implications for our national security as well. So it's a, it's a win-win <laughs> and we ought to be doing it, uh, but the uh, radical green left is doing everything they can to stop it. And they also have enlisted the help of a dozen state attorneys general. Yeah to help them uh, prosecute anybody who doesn't believe in Al Gore's inconvenient truth propaganda, right. uh, as well as those who fund organizations that uh, promote energy alternatives, promote, as you say, kind of a fueling freedom agenda. I mean, it's kind of a, a bit of a frightening time. It's not dissimilar to the IRS targeting people for their political and religious beliefs. Now you have state attorneys general doing the same thing with respect to your environmental beliefs. Yes, and you know, the, I, I actually would say that the most dangerous movement in America today is the green movement. Um, you know, there's an old saying, the greens are the new reds, and that's yeah. true, that the green movement is an, anti-industrialization, anti-freedom, anti-liberty, it's for much ma more massive government control of our lives. And you know, how can you control people's lives more than controlling their energy? Because everything we have, that cigar you're smoking, your drink, the uh, chair I'm sitting in, that camera, everything uh, is a derivative of cheap and affordable energy. And so if you want to shut down a place, uh, you know, go go after energy. There's a great photo in our, and you've probably seen this. North Korea. Uh, the North Korea photo. I mean, it tells you everything. Yeah. You? Anyway, North yeah. Korea is totally dark at night. South Korea is lit up at night. Um, what's the difference? Well, well, uh, you do have Kim Jong-un's reading light. <laughs> yeah, his that, palace that, is, yeah, is a light. That. That's the only little dot of yeah. light on the thing. Yeah. Um, but, but this is a real dangerous situation. I do think if we were to go green, you know, all in, I mean, the Sierra Club, these people, anybody who listen, who was giving money to the Sierra Club, shame on you. They have this new campaign to go 100% green energy. Keep it on the ground. No oil, no gas, no coal. Well, they just took away 75% of our electric power. <laughs> you know, where are we going to get the rest? The answer is we're going to have rolling brownouts and blackouts. And then these kids on college campuses at University of Chicago or Northwestern or DePaul who think it's so cool to go green, they're not going to be so happy when they can't charge up their iPods and their iPads and their, get their Netflix on TV. But as hard left uh, as the Sierra Club is, at least they're open to nuclear power. You okay. have you have some like the Bernie Sanders environmental justice yeah. crowd that essentially want us to to fuel the uh, the energy needs of this country uh, on switchgrass. <laughs> uh, that's true, and that's a pretty dangerous proposition. I mean, I, I always tell people, and they're surprised about this, that if you look at all energy consumption in America, where it comes from, of all the energy we consume, hmm, to be charitable, maybe four, maybe five percent of it comes from you know, wind and solar power and sawgrass. The rest of it is, you know, oil, gas, coal, nuclear power. Some comes from hydro power, but they're against anything that works. And, you know, if we tried to go totally green, though, we really would have major problems with just, you know, and this is happening, by the way, in some of the European countries that have gone all in on green. It's interesting, I don't know if you've been following it, Dan, that Germany is about 10 years ahead of us on the green movement. They're dramatically moving away from it. They finally concluded this stuff doesn't work. You know, it's way, way too expensive to compete in global markets. So their manufacturers can't compete now because they're making things with much more expensive energy than we are. It seems like uh, we should just look at everything Europe has done 10 years ahead of us with respect to immigration <laughs> policy, yeah, right, exactly. environmental policy, yeah, and just say, be, let don't do that. I mean, direction. this is what, yeah. you know, freedom lovers That's true. Uh, in the West well, and places like Britain, Dane Hannon. You want to see socialism? Yeah. You go to Athens, Greece, you know, uh, or, or, or Venezuela. Caracas. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, Vince Scully recently opined on socialism. I don't know if you caught that. I know you're a big baseball fan. Vince Scully, as an aside, as he's broadcasting the Dodgers game, talked about uh, socialism and uh, look what's happening in Venezuela. And oh, by the way, the richest person in Venezuela is Hugo Chavez's daughter. 
I mean, right, I I'm mean, sure that got a good reception in Los Angeles. I'm sure it did too. <laughs> but, no, but he's absolutely right. I mean, you, know, you, know. What's, you know, this brings me back to the energy thing. So what's interesting is what is the left's main anthem right now, you know, stopping income inequality? Well, if you want to increase income inequality, there's no better way to do that than to shut down cheap and affordable energy because that means low income people are going to not be able to afford energy and the tom styers of the world you know right. him he's the one who's the funding so many of these democratic causes do you think he cares if his utility bill doubles every month no after making all his money in fossil of fuels of course and now he's making all his money in uh green energy that's the other part of the story that's not well told is that um, a lot of these uh, you know, billionaire investors who are, who are funding the Democratic Party, they have a vested financial interest in solar power, wind power, because they've invested in those. And, you know, we and they're a, being subsidized by their friends at the uh, government, a la Terry McAuliffe, and yeah, as well as Steyer. $150 billion we spent at the federal level in the last 10 years under Bush, who was terrible on energy, and um, Obama, who's even worse, subsidizing windmills and green uh, solar power. And, um, you know, we've got three or four percent of our electricity from that. So it's a bit been a huge waste of money. What I, what I'm for is just a level playing field. Let's, you know, whatever works, let's do it. <laughs> if coal works, you know, what's happening with coal is really dastardly. I mean, we I live in Virginia where we have whole towns that have been shut down because of Obama's environmental rules. Uh, you know, third and fourth generation um, coal miners in those towns. You go to them today, and it's they're deserted with just people in unemployment lines or people on on meth, and it's it's disgraceful. Well, it's the same thing here in Southern Illinois. You go to coal country in yeah, Southern yeah, Illinois, Illinois, Franklin County, state. and yeah. we've got more coal here than in terms of uh, inert energy than Saudi Arabia has oil. Yeah, that's true. And but but it's being decimated. Good thing, Good by, thing that you've got all these state legislators who are pro, so pro coal. Well, yes, this is the struggle. Well, the, frankly, the struggle here is not dissimilar to the struggle in some of these socialist catastrophes like Venezuela. It's kind of an order of magnitude, but it's the same idea. The rich are insulated from terrible public policy and the people who bear the brunt are middle income people or to, to some extent lower income people who face these regressive policies. Well I always tell the story that uh, you know when I went to Africa a few years ago and went to some of these remote villages um, you know by the way great people the nicest people I've ever met in my life but um, what they don't ha they're still living like it's the 16th or 17th century yeah. what they don't have is energy <laughs> they don't have they you know they don't have a reliable uh, you know, electricity. So our green groups go in there and say, you know, use windmills and solar. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And, you know, if you just had reliable energy and clean water in these towns, you could increase the living standards by 10 years. Do you think the people in these African villages are worried about global warming? I right. mean, come on, really? Right. I mean, this is something that a really rich elite people worry about. Well, so um, speaking of energy, you know, let's transition to one of the other hats you wear, and that is along with <laughs> Art Laffer and Larry Kudlow, the kind of free market junta, if you will, uh, you're an economic policy advisor to the Trump campaign. We are. Uh, it's been interesting, and I, you know, I've really loved it working with uh, Trump. I, I've met him a couple times in person now. We've had good, really productive meetings with him. That's Donald Trump right there. Wow, uh, yeah, his and, ears are uh, <laughs> He's going to be tweeting yeah, about you shortly. He is, uh, but he's been, he's a charming guy. He listens. I mean, I think he's listening to our advice. We, we're putting together a really good tax plan. We're putting together. Uh, by the way, I want to show it to your audience. This is Steve Moore's phone. Yeah, wow. I'm still living that in is, the 1980s. Yeah. That's a, that's <laughs> the a museum. Old, yeah. <laughs> right, so uh, that's, don't have to worry about texting Steve Moore. He doesn't have that cap capacity. Um, so uh, anyway, it's been. I, I think Trump has a great economic plan. Uh, you know, I, I'm annoyed at some of my conservative and libertarian friends, and I haven't talked to you about it. But you know, those who say, "Well, I'm going to vote for Hillary," or even uh, the never libertarian, Trump, never Trump. Crowd. I think it's crazy. I think this is a consequential election. Trump is much better on tax policy. He's much better on energy policy. He's going to cut government spending. He's going to repeal Obama. Um, some of the things he stands for, like some of the trade restrictions, I'm not in favor of. But I think on balance, this is a pretty, you know, he's over here, she's over here. And I also do think, you know, I am I find it very attractive that he's not a professional politician, that he's not scripted. You know, Hillary is the ultimate, you know, can you think of anyone, Hillary, anyone on the planet who's more of a Washington insider than Hillary Clinton? And more mechanical. Right. Um, and less likable. And less likable. I mean, the cackle is infectious. I mean, I really, you know, that really softens her. But no, that's exactly but right. But, but, but it's also one of the reasons that Trump still is, is competitive in this race is because she is as unpopular so as he is. But um, the, the he is part is a problem. I think, look, I think the reason that Trump is going to win this race, and I do, even though he's down in the polls right now, is because you look at the, the killer 
statistic right now for Hillary is the is the country on the right track or the wrong track? That poll, right? And that poll for the last couple of years has shown three, um, almost three to about one. Sixty-five yeah. percent say wrong track. Twenty to twenty-five percent say yeah. So you're about, uh, not quite three to one, but yeah. pretty close. If you're, Hillary is running for Obama's third term, how do you win when people want change and they certainly don't want a, uh, you know another four years of Obama? But going back to the role that you're playing along with yeah. your colleagues for Trump. Um, it's got got these good policy proposals that you're helping to yep. sh craft and shape. So when is he going to start talking about fuel and repealing Obamacare and uh, uh, some of these other matters that may provide more political advantage for him as well? Well, as, he as, does. The, as the outsider businessman, and yeah. less about uh, some right. of the other things that have, yeah. fr frankly, made the last three weeks of the campaign pretty difficult for him. That's for sure. He's had a, you know, bad couple of weeks. No, quite. Maybe the worst two weeks of his campaign have been the last two. Um, I now, to be fair to Trump, he does talk about this, and he gave a speech two or three weeks ago on energy policy in North Dakota, which was fabulous. It was mm. right, like practically upsurged right out of our book. Uh, it didn't get any attention because the, tr the press doesn't pay any attention to that. It's you know when he says something that could offend somebody somewhere, you know, that's what they play up. But I, I'm very angry. At, I've just said this on your radio show. I, I think the Republicans are wimps. You know, when is the last time, Dan, you saw any Democrat um, denounce something that Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton said? When? Right. When? Right. When? They always close yeah. ranks. Yeah, they do. They the answer to that question is never, right? right. I mean, you go Google it, you're not going to find Hillary Reid saying, how dare Hillary Clinton say such and such. I mean, no matter, I mean, and she says outrageous things. Remember, four or five months ago, she equated Republicans to terrorists. Right. Um, you know, she wants all, every coal miner to lose their job. Did you see the few Democrats that are left in what, Joe Manchin run to the uh, microphone and say, how dare Hillary say this? I demand to her to renounce what she said. No, it's actually, that's actually a great illustration because what did Joe Manchin did do he hosted a little town hall with her right to try and to shore that her didn't up. work out and so well no though. it didn't it didn't <laughs> right. but right. i mean it shows yeah. you that so here's what i do i'm gonna try i mean bill buckley used to say this is that the, the republicans do a bad job picking up their wounded on the battlefield mm -hmm. where the democrats do uh, she's point. she's struggling in coal country point. she's struggling in west virginia in advance of their primary so they let's, let's let's bring her in yeah, and right. joe manchin you host a little town hall right. for her right. um whereas uh on the other side you've got a lot of people that are jettisoning donald trump i'm not going to the convention he's this he's that essentially adopting the description of Trump that is being promulgated by the New York so, Times. You know, for example, you know, your Senate candidate here, uh, Mark Kirk, right. the Republican, is, is the incumbent. Um, if I were advising Mark, and Mark's a friend of mine, I like him, I, I'd say, don't, when they bait you about what do you think about Donald Trump, don't go after Donald Trump attack Hillary, you know, and say, well, Hillary, what about what Hillary said about this or that? Or I, you know, Hillary's completely out to lunch on this and pivot back. I mean, the, you're right. The Democrats are so much better at that. And if the Republicans lose, it'll be partly because of this that they, and, and there's also another element of this though, Dan. Republicans, in my opinion, have been so beaten down by the left for 30 years. You're racist, you're xenophobes, you're bigots, da, da, da. So what, so Trump says something and, and the way he rushed the, the, the microphone said, I'm not a bigot. I'm not, it's that guy. It's Trump who's the bigot. See what a big man I am. I'm willing. I mean, that's crazy. Why would they do that? Mm. Well, now, just on, on the policy front, though, going back to that briefly, um, you mentioned trade, which kind of glossed over it. I mean, trade uh, accounts for about a fifth of the jobs in this country now, uh, exporting and import, uh, importing goods. And Donald Trump uh, sounds very much like uh, if this was a different era, it would be Smoot, Hawley, and Trump. <laughs> Well, I hope not. Uh, by the way, Smoot Hawley was certainly a catastrophe for the country, um, and it helped prolong significantly the Great Depression. Uh, turned what was just a financial uh, downturn into a Great Depression. But, um, you know, look, I've talked to Trump about trade, and, you know, what I believe would be a smart position for Trump is just to, to keep saying, look, we're going to negotiate better deals, because the truth is, the vast majority of Americans don't believe that these trade deals that have been negotiated for the last 20 years have been pro-American worker. They believe that, you know, they're putting America last and that China, you know, cheats and that Japan cheats. And the, and the truth is they do cheat. Right. So maybe negotiating um, better deals will, in, in the long run, actually help promote 
global trade because I, I don't know I, I I am a free trader no doubt about it and I'm not wincing at all on that but I do think if you have a vast majority of Americans who think free trade is not in America's interest we better do something to assuage them of their fears or else the whole um, free trade movement will cave in yeah and so and and just to be clear just at least philosophically as an economist it pays to be preemptively free trade right so I mean part of this isn't negotiating good deals. I mean, if you're a, a purist, a free market purist, you would say, I'm going to be free trade even no if what. even if that's, my trading yeah, partners are cheating. Sort of, right, exactly. And that's, uh, you know, my friends at Cato Institute would say that, you know, we should just be unilaterally free trade right. because it helps us. Uh, you know, I'm not there. I think uh, if we can use our leverage. So the best outcome would be for both countries to be free trade. Right. So if we're only free trade and they're not, maybe we can use our leverage to make these countries force them to be more free trade. And it's in their, obviously it's in their own interest to be free trade, but maybe we could, we can do that. And, and, not, and by the way, it's not just trade though. It is true that these countries like China and Japan, but especially China, they are stealing our patents and our copyrights right. and intellectual property. That's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, what we produce in this country more and more is incredible inventions and pharmaceuticals and drugs and computer software and uh, those kinds of things are stolen by the so to some extent the rest of the world free the rides and freeloads on our inventions and our ingenuity and that too they have to reimburse us for those kinds of things. and indicting some uh, Chinese nationals in absentia is not enough to really uh, <laughs> strike a blow against piracy as the Obama regime has essentially contented yeah. itself to well do. I mean the problem for Obama with Obama is they, they're too busy going after Google an American company you know than they are you know these Chinese companies that are that actually are stealing so uh, but, but, but so, so this also speaks to the Trump getting back on script and even if they don't cover the speech in North Dakota meaning the Washington press corps you know forcing, I mean, people will cover Trump. So forcing this into the conversation when he's on the Sunday talk shows or everywhere else. And that is going back to speaking to Americans' real economic security concerns that we have, we have numbers that say we have full employment, but there's millions of Americans who feel like their life is worsening and the prospects for their children are uh, even more frightening. And, and it seems like over the last, since he essentially secured the nomination, Trump has kind of messages. moved away yeah, from that. I, I agree. You're exactly and, right. And we got to get, like, if I, you know, I believe that if, if Trump between now and the election talked nothing except the economy and jobs, he would win, you know. Uh, now, people like the fact that Trump is Trump, you know, they like, a lot of people like the fact that he's not scripted and that he'll say, you know, so I, I don't want to, you know, change the man's persona, but I think he's got to be more disciplined. I've told him this, you know, you've got to be more disciplined in your message. Talk about the economy. I mean, Democrats are incredibly disciplined, you know, in that regard. They never talk about it. They never leave the script. And I'm saying, you know, Trump would be better off if he moved in that direction. I don't want him to be entirely scripted because that's part of his charm. And, you know, when I get into a taxi cab or talks to a construction worker or a school teacher or a vet, you know, what do you like about Donald Trump? He says it like it is and that he's not scripted. He's not a professional politician. And they like the fact that he's going to rattle the cages in Washington. And frankly, I live in Washington. It is time to rattle those cages. And this really is my theme is if Trump wins, and I think he will, it will be a remaking of the Republican Party and the elites of the party. They're, they're not, most of, you know, elites of the party who say they won't vote. They can't stomach right. Trump. So fine. You know, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Uh, if, you know, if they don't want to leave, but this will be a more pro worker, uh, party that, that takes into account the concerns, uh, and the fears of, uh, the average worker. Because the Democrats don't care about working class Americans anymore. They've sided with Tom Steyer and the Greens and, you know, the feminists and, and groups like that. So I, I think, but you're right. Trump has to keep it focused on the economy. Period. But this is this is the opportunity to bring back those to bring in, I should say, those people that the Republican Party has for. I mean, the Democrat Party has formally jettisoned. So you know, trade unionists and and yes, others yes. that and kind he's of are, that. Are, are small C conservative and don't have a home right now. Exactly. You're, no, that's and if he pulls this off, you're going to get millions of those. And it, this is interesting because. Not all, but most of the trade unions are, are endorsing Hillary. And Trump is right. It's like, how in the world can you endorse Hillary? She's against, she's trying to destroy your jobs. You know, how can, you know, and he's got to keep pressing that message because you know this, you're old enough to remember this. Um, you know, Ronald Reagan won millions of uh, union 
households. Right, the old Reagan Democrats. Yeah, the old Reagan Democrats. And I think those are, and if he wins, there could be a permanent realignment of the party. And that's what I'm saying. You know, the neocons, the ones who want America to be adventurous around the world, they're the ones who are most threatened by Trump. And the other people who are threatened by Trump is the political class. Uh, there is, you've been in politics, you know this, there's a professional political class in both parties. Uh, it's a cartel. I mean, Ted Cruz was right about that. Not just the, the politicians, the elected officials, but also the consultants. And, exactly. The you know. pollsters, the consultants, the lobbyists. And it's this incestuous relationship. And they're not ideological. <laughs> they don't care. They just want somebody they can do business with. They can't do business with Trump, but I guarantee you they can do business with Hillary. Yeah. And so a lot yeah. of these Republican consultants, they're the people who are slamming Trump the hardest. I mean, Illinois, you hail from Illinois. Illinois is like a microcosm of that problem in D.C., which is the, the permanent institutional class, which is, you know, if, you, if you're if you in, we're in. If uh, you're not in, we're still in. <laughs> exactly. We're always yeah. in. We'll outlast you. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. That's the first thing they say to a new governor or a new mayor, you know. Well, so, we'll be long, here long after you're gone. <laughs> well, so, so somebody who's also worked on the Hill and been advised, advised Republican candidates and Republican leadership on economic policy, up and down the food chain. Uh, 24 Republican U.S. Senators are for re-election. You've got Paul Ryan uh, seemingly kind of still trying to find his sweet spot as Speaker of the House. Yes. And so so, uh, so much focus on Trump. Understandably, he's the nominee or presumed to be. Um, what about uh, Republicans in the House and those 24 Republican senators and the rest of their colleagues in the Senate and what their policy agenda is and what their brand is and what ideas they're promoting or not promoting? Um, it's a good question. You know, Paul Ryan has been putting out these white papers and so on, on p poverty reduction, tax reform, welfare reform. You know, it's good stuff, but I don't think people pay a lot of attention to that. I just yeah. don't. I think, um, you know, my attitude is Paul Ryan, who's a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, I love Paul Ryan, stop telling us what you're gonna do and do it. <laughs> we don't need more white papers and policy visits. Just do it. You have control of the House. You have control of the Senate. Get these bills to Barack Obama's desk and force him to veto them. I mean, that's what the Democrats did against Bush. Why aren't Republicans doing that to Obama? Force him to veto a corporate tax cut. Force him to veto a, a bill that reigns in some of these ridiculous Obamacare mandates. Uh, force him to veto the bill that uh, reigns in these EPA rules that are putting our coal miners out. And uh, stand with these people. Uh, they're you know, look, these people really are spineless. They are, they are the pro-life party because they are in the fetal position all the time. And, <laughs> and people, I, so I'm frustrated with Paul a little bit. Stop telling us what you're going to do and do it. But so, but so what is the problem with Paul Ryan then? Because it's not like he is, I mean, I know he's got a primary challenge, but it's, it's, not, it's not like he's in a particularly precarious place politically himself. Um, he has this opportunity to lead the way he would have had an opportunity to lead had he and Mitt Romney won in 2012. So it's something he's been thinking about for the 20 years he's been in DC sure. and he's uh, uh, aspired to opportunities to lead. He's got an opportunity to lead. So why isn't he doing what you're suggesting? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is because it is, you know, you've got 200 and whatever the number is, 228 Republicans, uh, and it's hard to keep get them all marching in the same direction. Um, I think part of it is, is that um, he doesn't agree with Trump on some things. So, but the things that he does agree with Trump, I'm like if the tax reform plan we're doing with uh, Donald Trump that our Laffer and Larry Kudlow and I are working on, that's right in you know the the Paul Ryan sweet zone, and I, I don't understand why he is so. Uh, so eager to, to attack Trump. I, I do think there's a hang together, hang, hang separately uh, problem the Republicans find themselves in and, and they fall for the bait. They keep attacking Trump and they're attacking Trump as aggressively as uh, as um, Hillary is. I, but, but Paul Ryan, for example, I mean, he could also provide leadership where Trump would follow. I, know. I mean, if you say to Trump, look, hey, Donna, I, I need you on board for this corporate tax a I'll bill that I'm going to run, I'll, and Trump think, probably would fall in line in the interest of advancing his own political yeah. fortune, but, but it's clear that Ryan hasn't made that overture. No, because I think he's fallen victim of the Mitt Romney syndrome, where I have a 57 blank plan, yeah. <laughs> and people want two blanks, you know, 57, you know, and I think there's just too much. It's too full of plate, and he's got to concentrate on two or three things. If I were Paul Ryan, I were the speaker, given the lousy jobs report that we had and the lousy Fed report that came out a week or two ago that shows, you know, less than 2% growth from now until kingdom come is come out with a 
a real Republican stimulus plan, cut the corporate tax rate to 15% and small business tax to 15%, uh, allow repatriation of all this capital that's leaving the United States, uh, get that, ram that through Congress and send it to Obama's desk. I mean, um, you know, the, as I said, the Democrats are so good at forcing the Republicans' hands, but we're not good. And that's and, why we're the stupid party. And what do you think the, the best argument is for those that have qualms about Trump? Um, seems to me one of the best arguments has been Supreme Court course, justices, right? Of Especially course, with yeah. the story recently that Clarence Thomas but, uh, could look, retire you know, after I, November. I go beyond that, though, Dan. I, look, but, but here, I, I but, think that's obvious, but I think it's a bigger point. I, I think these people fail to acknowledge that we are in a cultural war in this country with the left. The left is out of control. I mean, I've been at too many events where I've been shouted down by the left mm -hmm. or shut up by the left. I've been at events where they come in and they're just, you know, it's the left is out of control in America. We have to take back our country from them. And if you give them four more years, you're affirming what they're doing. I mean, Cleveland, I'll be at Cleveland. I don't know if you're going yeah, to the convention. Yeah, are yeah. you going to be broadcasting yeah. from there? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll do your, the show when I'm yeah, out there. But, um, the left, I, I think the left is going to shut that city down. Yeah. Good. I want the American people to see. They may shut down Philadelphia, see. too. <laughs> yeah, while exactly. They're at it. I mean, yeah. I mean, not good. I wanted the American people to see what these people are, are up to and how radicalized they've become. But the argument from conservatives, the Never Trumps, even, even listen to Steve Moore say, yeah, Trump has an economic plan. Steve Moore and Art Laffer and Larry Kudlow. It's great. I agree with it. But the problem is, I don't trust Trump. He's ultimately a man on the left or he's a man without any moorings. And so I can't trust it. So that's why I can't sign on. So what do you say to that? Uh, I think he's pretty conservative. I think, you know, look, he's a deal maker. He's a businessman. If he gets into the White House, he's going to make deals. Uh, some of them we're not going to like, you know, we're not going to like it. We'll, we'll complain about them on the, right. on the radio. But a lot of them will, will move the country in a more positive direction. I believe there, after eight years of Obama, there's so much low-hanging fruit out there. So many just easy things you can do from day one. I mean, get the pipeline going, you know. We've sent some of these, you know, anti-growth regulations. It's just changing the personnel. My God, I mean, when I talk to business and women, they say, you can't believe how anti-business these people are. They hate business. The people are running the regulatory agencies. People are policy. Putting good people who are pro-business rather than anti-business, that makes a big sense. I'm not, I know what Treasury you're thinking. Treasury Secretary Steve Moore. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, we could do worse. Larry yeah. Kudlow. <laughs> See, this is the thing. He, he released his uh, possible Supreme Court nominee list. He needs to release where Steve Moore, Art Laffer, and Larry Kudlow economy, are going to fit in I think in the, the economy is going to be very strong. And I think he's going to be pro-life. And I think uh, he's going to put people, good people on the Supreme Court. Uh, so he may make some deals that, we, you know, we don't we don't like, but I think on balance, Hillary is a disaster. She's she's four more years, and people forget. If you get, they say, well, we'll win back in 2020. No, it's hard to beat an incumbent. Yes. If Hillary wins in 2016, you know the odds are, she, you know, that she's going to win again, and that was 16 years out of power. If you put six the Democrats in charge of the government for 16 years with all the Supreme Court. You know, appointments. We're not going to recognize our country by the year 2024. A lot of people, to your point, made that same argument about Bill Clinton to punish George Herbert Walker Bush in '92. You know, we'll give him one, one term. Those we'll and give I, him one term, yeah. and then we'll win in '96. I have to say, I was one of those people. I, I actually voted against George W. George H. W. Bush in 1992 because I, I could not forgive him for the tax increase. It was right. just unforgivable. Right. And actually, we got Bill Clinton, but then we got a Republican Congress that. You know, that uh, with Newt Gingrich. I mean, it is funny how all these things work out, but let's give Trump. Trump a try. I mean, he's won the won the uh, primary. He's bringing in millions of new people into the party, um, and I think he's going to move the country, you know, in a very pro growth direction. All right, that's Steve Moore, economic policy advisor to the Donald Trump campaign, former Wall Street Journal editorial board, current chief economist at the Heritage Foundation, and the author of the new book Fueling Freedom, which you should pick up. Steve Moore, thanks Thank so you much Dad. for Good joining us. Yeah. Appreciate it as always. Yeah.